Welcome to the Who, What, Why podcast. I'm your host, Jeff Sheckman. During the Cold War, the Soviet Union and its leaders occupied a lot of mental real estate in the minds of Americans. Khrushchev banging his shoe at the UN and touring an American kitchen with Richard Nixon. The Cuban Missile Crisis and the threat of mutually assured destruction. And then Perestroika and Gorbachev and Yeltsin, all are deeply ingrained in the history of the second half of the 20th century. In the 21st century, Vladimir Putin occupies all that same real estate in our collective consciousness, and certainly in the mind of Donald Trump. But how did we get here? How did Putin get to be Putin? At one point, it seemed as if the former Soviet Union would give way to some form of constitutionalism. I guess Churchill was right. The Soviet Union and Russia still is a riddle wrapped in a mystery inside an enigma. The only thing that was certain was that it would act in its self-interest. And with Putin, Trump, and the oligarchs, even more so. If it's true that Putin, who is now president of Russia for life, is having that much of an influence on us, that he helped determine the outcome of our last election and is endangering the lives of our troops, shouldn't we know more about Putin and how he came to power? Certainly a portrayal that's more than Beck Bennett on Saturday Night Live. That's where my guest Catherine Belton comes in. Catherine Belton is an investigative correspondent for Reuters. For six years, she was the Moscow correspondent for the Financial Times, and she previously reported on Russia for the Moscow Times and Business Week. Her most recent book is Putin's People, How the KGB Took Back Russia and Then Took on the West. It is my pleasure to welcome Catherine Belton here to the Who, What, Why podcast. Catherine, thanks so much for joining us. Hi, thank you so much for having me on. There was a moment in time that it seemed like in the post-Soviet era that, that Russia might become somewhat of a democracy, that it might have a real economy. What happened? What, what, what destroyed that moment? Uh, yeah, I think that's a good question. And I think the what destroyed that moment was, unfortunately, Vladimir Putin, and perhaps even more than him, uh, the clan of security men surrounding him who came with him to power. I think maybe perhaps Putin himself might have wanted to just serve as president for a few years, but the security men who helped propel him to power certain, well, certainly weren't going to have any of that. Uh, they were bent from the outset, really, on on restoring Russia's standing as a global player. They always wanted a kind of a redrawing of the post-Cold War geopolitical map. They wanted a greater voice for Russia. They thought Putin coming to power had ushered in a, a new era of stability for Russia. They were eliminating political opponents. They were blessed with a rapidly rising oil prices, which stabilized the economy. Russia was no longer dependent on handouts from the international money fund and the World Bank. And they believed that this all made Russia kind of uh, qualifiable for a much greater stay in, in world affairs. But I think the West preferred to see Russia as an economic basket case, uh, that it was weak, the kleptocracy of its leaders as, as Putin and his KGB men rushed to take over greater chunks of the economy was more about these men lining their own pockets than any potential uh, security threat. But unfortunately, as we've seen, Putin and the security men around him are very much locked in a Cold War mindset. These still kind of hardwired into their systems that the West and the US in particular is, is the main adversary. Uh, I think that position has evolved also over time as the West has ignored Russia and its demands for a greater say. And now they use the cash at their command essentially as a huge kitty, a, a slush fund that they can use to try and undermine Western democracies. It's kind of a repeat of, of what they did in, in Soviet times. Then they use front men and intermediaries to try and corrupt Western politicians then and fund influence operations for the KGB and disinformation campaigns. Only now what we see, it's obviously a gazillion times magnified because because uh, uh, Russia's leaders have much more cash at their command. How did Putin become the leader of this group that took control at that point? Yes, he was a good question. So he was, you know, he kind of emerged really from, from nowhere in the beginning uh, when Yeltsin uh, announced that he, he wanted Putin to become his prime minister and indeed his successor as as 
as president in August 1999, it kind of took everyone in Russia and in the West by surprise because Putin was this little known gray figure. He was a bureaucrat who'd served very much behind the scenes in the Kremlin, uh, even though he'd sort of actually very rapidly risen through the ranks there. He sort of had a breathtaking career, actually, from between 96 and, and 99 when he made it as Russia's prime minister. He'd, his rise was very fast and all the way he was being watched over by a group of security men. One of them, one of his close allies has said that his initial appointment to the Kremlin was never an accident. They were testing him out as a as a possible kind of uh, future leader. He was always very uh, well equipped. He was very engaging on one-on-one -on -one co uh, conversations, very charming, very efficient at getting tasks done. Uh, but really, um, you know, he'd been in the background uh, Yeltsin in 1999 was very weak. He'd been dealt a terrible blow by the August 98 financial crisis, and he was also being hunted by hardline Russian prosecutors who, with the help of some of Putin's uh, allies in the security forces, were threatening Yeltsin's family with a legal investigation, and there was a criminal probe going on into their use of credit cards which had been given to them by a Swiss construction firm which had landed a huge contract to reconstruct the Kremlin. And it looked like these credit cards were some kind of kickback. The sums involved were hundreds of thousands of dollars, which is nothing compared to today's corruption scandals. But in Yeltsin's weakened state, it was really a great threat to him and his family. So they were looking for someone to protect them. And Putin did a very good job in a sort of pretending he was the one he who would uh, protect them. He was always very loyal. He'd sort of showed this through some of his past actions. He'd protected his former mentor from St. Petersburg, the St. Petersburg mayor, from another hardline uh, investigation from hardliners. He'd helped him escape Russia even. He'd even broken the law to protect his former mentor. And all the while he was paying lip service to the ideals of democracy and and, uh, and the liberal economy. So I think Yeltsin's family and Yeltsin himself probably very much wanted to think that this young uh, former KGB officer was, was one of them. And certainly they were impressed by, firstly, by the fact that he was young and he was healthy and he wasn't ailing like Yeltsin had been for most of his presidency. And, you know, they I think they just didn't want to kind of uh, examine some of the more disturbing aspects of Putin past, uh, particularly uh, when he was running St. Petersburg in the early 90s as, as the deputy mayor, when he'd really joined hands with uh, security forces and organized crime to, to run much of the city's economy. And I think they, they didn't want to look past uh, the fact that, yes, he, was, uh, he had ties in the security services, therefore he could protect them, but he looked like someone who nevertheless was going to try to continue Yeltsin's legacy and bring bringing the market to Russia and sort of continue on the path of, of democratic reforms. But unfortunately for all of this, uh, that turned out not to be the case. And in fact, in their desperation, uh, they'd landed on uh, a representative of a, of a KGB clan that was actually the most ruthless of all and was prepared to stop at nothing almost to shore up their own power. At what point did Putin and, and the power that he had amassed supersede the security forces that brought him to power. That's a very delicate dance that he's been sort of handling all this time. I think for quite some time in the first years of his presidency, uh, the men, the security men around him, uh, and most of all, Nikolai Patrushev, who was a year older than him, he was head of the FSB, the KGB successor agency, and he was the one who really was sort of leading and trying to make sure Putin remained as president, uh, that he didn't sort of seek 
week to serve a, a few years and, and then step down. Um, and all the while, he had these other sort of uh, KGB connected allies who were beginning to take over bits of the economy. And as his reign continued, they took over more and more. And indeed, they usurped the entire court system, which allowed them essentially to pick off any strategic business they wanted. So it became imperative for this group of men that Putin remained in power. But And really, I was told by one ally that when they met, uh, normally this, this inner circle would sort of talk equally among themselves. But I think at some point, uh, particularly after uh, 2014, when uh, Putin annexed Crimea, it was uh, the, 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 the Ukrainian territory uh, after Ukraine's uh, revolution when the pro-Kremlin president uh, Viktor Yanukovych uh, fled and uh, sort of pro-Western forces at least temporarily uh, took over the country. Uh, Russia, Putin's Kremlin responded by annexing this peninsula where Russia had always kept its Black Sea naval fleet. And we all remember uh, the West response. We remember the sanctions. This was the first time that really Russia was acting so aggressively and actually annexing and, and taking over uh, another country's territory. Um, but for Putin, it provided a huge boost to his po popularity. It was seen as this great patriotic move. Most of the population kind of felt humiliated after the collapse of the Soviet Union, that the Russia had been sort of neglected. And, and it was sort of, you know, it was the, the a weak, seen as a weak country. And here was Putin flexing his muscles, returning as he saw it, uh, part of the Russian Empire. And it really did go down well with the population and it also raised his standing in the eyes of the security men. And so it began that sort of when they'd have these meetings of his inner circle, instead of speaking equally between themselves, Putin was the one who would hold forth for hours and indeed they would not interrupt him. So that's really the moment when he kind of came into his own. We hear a lot about the oligarchs, the ones he installed, the ones that really took a lot of money out of the country. Talk about the nexus between the oligarchs that came in and the security forces. Yeah, that's also a good question. So the security forces um, really led the drive to take over a private business uh, in the in the third year, really, of, of Putin's presidency. This began with the attack on uh, Mikhail Khodorkovsky, who in those days was Russia's richest man. He owned the country's biggest oil company. He was really try he was trying to sell uh, his control of his oil company to the West. He was deep in talks with Exxon and Chevron. And indeed, if that uh, those negotiations had succeeded, the Russia would be a very, very different country today. But he was also embarking on policies that, that Putin's security men just couldn't really stand to see. He was trying to lobby for the construction of privately built uh, oil pipelines that would be independent from the state and that would remove a, a crucial lever of control that the state had over the oil tycoons. And he was also uh, funding opposition politicians and indeed they believed that Khodorkovsky had presidential ambitions of his own that he might stage a run for the presidency in 2008 and meanwhile he had billions of dollars of his own at his command and the security men just really did believe that they just couldn't allow this and so it ended up being quite easy for them to persuade Putin to take this tycoon on and actually throw him in jail and gradually uh, take over bit by bit, piece by piece, his oil company. Um, but they did so in quite a, a gentle and steady way for today's standards, even though they jailed him on what uh, Khodorkovsky has always claimed were politically motivated, trumped up charges. Uh, the way they took over his oil company was sort of like death by a thousand cuts. First, they pretended to negotiate. Uh, they filed uh, back tax charges against the company, which are very selectively and retroactively applied, which allowed some Western investors to think, hmm, maybe the Kremlin's right about this. And actually, it allowed Western investors to eventually say, you know what, 
we don't care. The Kremlin's going to take over the energy sector. But you know what? For us, uh, profits are more important than how the Kremlin is essentially taking over the rule of, rule of law and usurping the legal and political process. And we're going to join the queue to take over chunks of his company too because, you know, oil prices are going up and we're going to make a lot of money. And this really undermined the message that some officials in the U.S. State Department were trying to make that, you know, usurping the rule of law and taking over an oil company in this way was going to be incredibly detrimental to Russia's investment climate. But the whole message was undermined whenever uh, another Western investor would pop up and join the queue to be part of the the Kremlin's takeover. So, um, so the security men kind of did, they did lead the charge and it was uh, Putin's KGB connected allies who were the most immediate beneficiaries of this process. Uh, Putin had a very close ally named Igor Sechin who was uh, eight or maybe 10 years younger than Putin and he always followed uh, Putin like a shadow throughout his career. But he was the one leading the legal campaign against Yukos, against Hodokovsky, and he was the one who ended up ended up directly benefiting because he chaired the state oil company, which gobbled up Yukos and, and took it over. And then there was another KGB-connected ally that Putin had known since St. Petersburg, perhaps even uh, from before, from his time in East Germany when he served as a KGB officer there, uh, who essentially took over most of Russia's oil exports exports. Uh, he uh, he established a, a very successful oil trader in Switzerland named Gunvor, which became the world's third biggest trader. And he was sort of swallowing up uh, most of the country's strategic cash flows. And indeed, uh, as the U.S. Treasury later put it, they believed that Putin had a direct investment in Gunvor. But it was more about more than just about sort of lining the pockets of these KGB allies. Of course, they enriched themselves along the way. Indeed, they thought they deserved it because they'd res- restored stability to Russia after the chaos of the Yeltsin years. Uh, but uh, it, but they also sort of justified it to themselves by saying this ha- also has a strategic purpose and indeed it, it has had a strategic purpose because now we see the sort of the web of cash at the command of, of Putin's security men and the KGB connected businessmen who are very close to Putin they are deeply embedded in Western markets they do have uh, for a lot of billions and billions of dollars at their command and we've seen how entities linked to them have been funding uh, politicians on the far left and the far right in Europe a bank uh, in 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 the Czech Republic with links to the oil trader that took over the the cash flow. Gennady Timchenko uh, was funding uh, Marine Le Pen's Front National uh, for a while. They made quite a substantial loan uh, in 2014 to this political group. Um, Timchenko, of course, denies any association with this, but uh, I think the evidence is clear to see. Um, so we really see this. They've got the network of cash across Europe and as we've unfortunately seen in the US as well and it doesn't just this system doesn't just extend to Putin's closest KGB uh, connected businessmen uh, since the takeover of the court system and even more so since 2008 when the Kremlin bailed out the more independent Yeltsin era tycoons uh, in the financial crash we've seen that they're sort of more and more dependent on the Kremlin too one of them told me that, you know, if we get a call from the Kremlin saying you have to spend one billion on this or that strategic project, we can't refuse, such as the command of, of Putin's security men now when they have all of law enforcement at their command and all of the, the entire court system. You essentially, if you're a businessman in Russia, particularly in a strategic sector, you own your business through Putin's grace, through the Kremlin's grace. You have to stay on the right side of them sometimes you'll carry out strategic tasks for the Kremlin without even being asked to because you're trying to get in the Kremlin's good books because to do any deals in Russia, you need Kremlin approval. We've talked a lot about Putin's consolidation of power and the economics that really brought so many of these oligarchs to power. 
Has there been an external political agenda, something that might be defined as some kind of foreign policy that, that Russia or Putin have that was the driving force behind some of these international investments? Um, yes, I think so. I think they really did want for Russia to be recognized as a as a kind of important global player. Indeed, we've heard this uh, quite frequently from from Putin himself. They they wanted a redrawing of the post Cold War era security map, and they have asked for this time and again. But essentially, the response that they got was for the West to sort of close its eyes and kind of bat. Russia offers a spent force. Uh, I think Putin most clearly first raised this issue in 2007 in February when he gave a speech at the Munich Security Conference and then he railed against sort of the West's expansion as, as Russia saw it onto its sphere of interest. The West was re- kind of con- continuing to go ahead to build a, a missile defense shield on Russia's borders in Romania and Poland, uh, regardless of, of Russia's protests. Uh, NATO was continuing its eastern expansion. And of course, Western officials would argue that joining NATO was the choice of the individual countries who were applying to join. But the Kremlin certainly didn't see it that way. They felt that they'd been promised at the, at the Soviet Union's collapse by Western and leaders that, that NATO would not cross a certain line and that was certainly not being observed. And I think for Putin at the beginning of his presidency, he'd, he'd also tried to make overtures to the West, like for instance, after September the 11th, he'd opened up Central Asia as a transit corridor for US troops so that they could fight in Afghanistan. Uh, but none of his overtures were ever reciprocated. He kind of felt ignored and he just got angrier and angrier. And I think they also felt that the West just had this very condescending attitude to them. And if you're a, a kind of a KGB man who kind of grew up in the Cold War, those reflexes are quite hardwired into your system. So what they did to fight back rather than build their own economy as a strong, powerful, competitive economy, they returned to the playbook of the 70s and 80s, which is when they used disinformation, uh, kind of uh, other plots to undermine uh, political stability in Western countries, such as as funding the far left and the far right. And they tried this campaign of active measures to essentially kind of try to sow chaos and and leverage existing weaknesses in the West uh, to kind of destabilize uh, the West rather than kind of trying to boost Russia's standing by making it a credible and respected play. By, by improving its own economy, they just decided that they would kind of try to tear up the order in the West. Um, so I guess, yeah, it's been a long, ongoing process, unfortunately. How has Putin evolved as a leader? How has he changed since he's been leading Russia? Um, well, I mean, he's certainly changed uh, externally. I guess all of us age, but uh, Putin's uh, <laughs> the way Putin looks has certainly changed uh, changed a lot. People say that he does actually look a bit like Brezhnev, and indeed his role rule is becoming more and more like Brezhnev. We're entering this era of stagnation. I think when he came to power, he was probably quite unsure of himself. He told everyone uh, he was just the hired manager who would hand over power after a few years. Uh, This has proved not to be the case, whether he wanted to or not, because certainly, as we've discussed, the security men around him didn't want to allow him to step down. I think he and his security men have become sort of more and more hostage to the system that they've built because they've committed uh, so many nefarious acts in in ensuring up their own power that it's risky for uh, Putin to step down now. And indeed, that's why we've seen all these shenanigans around changing the constitution to allow Putin to remain in power for another 16 years. So they're kind of uh, sort of becoming like a Brezhnev era rulers. And indeed, the prospects for the economy are the same because they're also scared, it seems, to make any kind of far reaching reforms in the economy to boost growth through increasing competition, because that would require 
require them to relinquish some of their hold on the economy and they seem like they they just don't want to risk doing that because they think if anyone else gets a hold of the billions at their command then their authority could be threatened so we're just facing this huge era of stagnation and indeed it was very telling that even in this campaign that that Putin was was holding for uh, the referendum on the constitutional change he announced some tax changes that they were going to boost income tax on Russia's most wealthy uh, at the moment income tax is only 13% for all and yet Putin only dared to raise it by two percentage points on the wealthy it's only risen to 15% and really I'm sure Russia's billionaires can afford to share more than that especially when the country's health care system is still in a state of dilapidation and yet he didn't dare to kind of go after their pocketbooks anymore because he doesn't want to kind of uh, destabilize this the status quo they kind of sort of handle everything now with such trepidation and indeed sort of one former uh, uh, government minister told me that these guys all they know how to do the the KGB men around Putin all they know how to do is is run black ops they know how to <laughs> essentially take over cash flows share it and divvy it between themselves and use the proceeds to destabilize other countries but they don't actually know how to develop their own economy and they don't have a vision for it apart from taking control is putin vulnerable in any way I think the longer this situation goes on, I think he has to be. I mean, really, so he has just pulled off this great latest trick, this referendum that he didn't even need because the laws had already been passed in March uh, by the parliament and the constitutional court, which would allow him to remain as president till 2036. And yet he still wanted a referendum. He wanted this nationwide vote because that would supposedly lend him the legitimacy that he needs to remain as as Russia's unchallenged supreme leader. Um, But really, the longer this situation situation goes on and uh, the longer that sort of uh, that Russia's economy is in a downturn, the more vulnerable at some point he's going to become to to a political challenge because, you know, he's had he's been blessed throughout his presidency really. The first two terms of his presidency there were soaring oil prices which really did help him approve the life of the Russian population. They, there was an emergence of a middle class. People could start going to nice restaurants and buy European cars and go on foreign holidays days and all this and then when that petered out because of his takeover of the economy he pulled off Crimea so that was a great boost to him but he's kind of running out of tricks now and uh, you know there's not much he can do now to improve the life of the population and they can see that he's still spending enormous amounts of money on foreign adventures such as the military campaign in Syria and funding other uh, allied countries such as Venezuela Venezuela. But in the meantime, uh, he's raised the pension age. Uh, the economy is uh, sort of been very badly impacted by the fallout from the coronavirus. And we're expecting wave after wave of bankruptcies after a debt moratorium is lifted in October. Already unemployment has been soaring. Russia hasn't been bailing out small and medium enterprises, as we've seen in some Western countries. And you know, there's and he's starting to lose support in the in, in, in from his core, which is Russia's industrial heartland, the working class, because you know their their lives are starting to be impacted. They're no longer seeing a kind of a, an improvement in their lives. In fact, they're getting worse. But how any opposition can actually emerge uh, in a condition where sort of the Kremlin controls the whole of the media uh, landscape. There is no independent television. Um, You know, all the newspapers are now under Kremlin control. It's very difficult to see. And and the security men, you know, they have control of of the courts. As we said, sort of one tycoon said to me, he said, look, how can we oppose it when they have all the power? So I don't 
really know what's going to happen and some suggest that if there were ever to be to a threat to Putin it would come from his own inner circle indeed there are voices uh, some within the intelligence establishment who complain that f- of Putin's lack of vision for the economy I guess we just don't know how things how bad things have to get before uh, sort of a challenger emerges and indeed if there is a challenger can they do, do so in, in such a a subtle way that they're not picked off before they can kind of mount their bid but I guess I guess we'll see but for Putin it's kind of uncharted territory for him because he's never had to deal with such bad conditions before and what internal credit has he gotten for his efforts in destabilizing the West particularly destabilizing the U.S. and his relationship with Donald Trump? Yeah, I think they've been largely uh, applauding uh, those efforts. Um, like I mentioned, this this sort of s- scene where members of his inner circle now don't uh, interrupt him and let him hold forth for hours with, without them, them speaking. And I think that's also partly due to the perceived success of, of getting uh, someone who, if not not their man directly is is certainly someone who very much suits the Kremlin's agenda in tearing up the post-Cold War uh, rule book and in kind of disrupting all the alliances between uh, the US and, and the EU, disrupting NATO, withdrawing troops from Germany, from the Middle East. Uh, you know, uh, the Kremlin's been sort of lapping up uh, each, almost each and every one of, of Trump's actions. But there are those uh, who do frown on, on some of the shenanigans Shenanigans, however, in particular, the sort of the goings on around the 2016 election campaign. Some believe that Russia's interference was was too obvious, that indeed it was kind of a, a keystone cop operation. And if Russia had been intelligent about it, they wouldn't have been found out. But but then again, maybe that was part of the game. But obviously it's it's a two it's a double edged sword because we have seen the kind of the more hawkish members of Trump's administration, they've been able, nevertheless, to impose very stringent sanctions on uh, some more and more of, of Russia's tycoons. Um, and indeed, it's a double-edged sword because now we have this very risky prospect that Trump might not be re-elected. Joseph Biden could come to power and indeed they fear even more sanct- even more strict sanctions uh, as a result of that. So I guess we've, we've got to see uh, yet uh, how whether there is going to be ever greater blowback for Russia uh, from its adventures in in the U.S. because we uh, we yet to see what the outcome of the 2020 election is and indeed will Russia be able to interfere again? But it's certainly something we should be on the lookout for. And finally, what does your reporting tell you? about the relationship between Putin and Trump? Well, we've all seen, and indeed it was sort of quite shocking to see how Trump and Putin interacted each other in the Helsinki summit when they when they first met. And Trump seemed to be so subservient to Putin that he would take Putin's denials of interference and meddling in the 2016 election over the words of the US's own intelligence officials uh, that he seemed to be sort of kowtowing to Putin and praising him for so successfully holding the the World Cup uh, football championship that year. Um, so it was a very strange picture that everyone was greeted by because of course we'd all heard the reports of, of Russian meddling but it kind of really slapped everyone very hard in the face as a reality when you saw how the two of them interacted with each other at at Helsinki and and Trump's very subservient uh, uh, stance. Um, So I guess (laughs) that seemed almost then to confirm the worst fears of of how Trump is in some way beholden to the 
Kremlin. Um, and we, indeed, we're yet to really understand the whole kind of web of financial interactions. Uh, much of that information is still uh, kind of subject to uh, disclosure. The Supreme Court is still meant to be deciding on whether Trump has to hand over his financial records, whether Deutsche Bank has to hand over its records and its dealings with, with Trump and, and with Russia. So we we yet to really get to the bottom of how uh, beholden Trump is to Russia. But what we do know is that for many, many years, he was working closely with a group of Moscow money men who were running an outfit called Bayrock in New York, who were building uh, three uh, Trump projects together with, uh, uh, together with the Trump organization for which they paid uh, Trump enormous and as yet undisclosed management fees uh, and uh, other licensing fees that we, we still don't know the, the full volume of. Uh, this hasn't been disclosed yet. And so, I mean, Trump was pursuing, of course, these the construction of Trump Towers in Moscow. These were projects that never got off the ground. Uh, but that's almost beside the point, because at the same time, this network of Moscow money men, uh, one of whom, Felix Sater, is have, has admitted to having quite high-level ties to Russian intelligence. Uh, he was able to get Ivanka Trump into Putin's office in the Kremlin. I mean, certainly have to be well-connected to be able to do that. And they had a very, very close working relationship with Trump for, for for quite some years. And indeed, that relationship stems back to 1987 when Trump first visited the Soviet Union. He was wowed by the architecture, the hospitality. The Soviet officials made a beeline for him because they loved the idea of this commercial real estate tycoon who could – they really did try to recruit him. We don't know whether their efforts at recruiting him was successful, but one former senior KGB officer has told me that he believed the KGB had recruited him. Whether or not uh, Trump knew he was recruited is another question, but after his first visit to the Soviet Union, the first thing he did was music to the Soviet officials' ears because he wrote an open letter published in several major US uh, newspapers, which also called for the tearing up of US alliances across Across the globe. He wanted uh, to end uh, America's alliance with Saudi Arabia. He wanted to end U.S. support for Japan. And this was like a, a KGB dream. So, yeah, I think we, we've still got a lot to learn. Catherine Belton, she's an investigative correspondent for Reuters. Her most recent book is Putin's People. Catherine, I thank you so much for spending time with us here on the Who, What, Why podcast. Thank you. Thank you. It's really good to talk. Thanks a lot. Thank you. And thank you for listening and for joining us here on Radio Who, What, Why. I hope you join us next week for another Radio Who, What, Why podcast. I'm Jeff Sheckman. If you like this podcast, please feel free to share and help others find it by rating and reviewing it on iTunes. You can also support this podcast and all the work we do by going to whowhatwhy.org forward slash donate.